Okay, uh, today we are going to be learning about human behavior and effective communication. Our references for today are going to be the uh, Aviation Instructor's Handbook, and the objective is at the end of this we want you to know how uh, human behavior is a result of uh, a human of acting to try to find a human need and understand what um, actually allows humans to hum communicate properly and to uh, behave in a way that would be conducive to learning. Training aids today, um, it's just going to be video format, really just talking, lecture based. And um, we're just going to go ahead and start off with human behavior. So. Like I was saying before, human behavior is it's defined as the result to satisfy basic needs. This could be anything from reacting to when you need food, when you need water, or if you need to, re or how you react to needing acceptance or respect, things like that. It's uh, both innate in human nature, and uh, it's based off the individual experience and environment. And uh, understanding this basic human behavior is imperative to successful instruction. So I need to properly understand how my human behavior is as well as you as a student. Secondly, we're going to go into human needs and motivation. So there's this pyramid that was created by a guy named Maslow. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And it starts out with your physiological needs, so you need sleep, shelter, food, things like this to survive. And then it keeps building up this pyramid where it's secondly, at the, the second level, would be safety and security. You, you can't learn if you don't feel safe. And uh, then you bring it up another level and that's gonna be your love and uh, your belongingness. So, if you feel like you don't belong somewhere or that nobody really cares about what you're saying, then it's going to be harder to learn. Next would be self-esteem. So if you don't believe in yourself, you don't think that you can be there, then it's going to be very hard to uh, be able to learn anything or be in a learning environment. And finally, uh, self-actualization, authenticity, and meaningfulness uh, really just understanding that you as a person uh, should be learning this or how you learn this is how that would be based off of. So physiological needs, they're gonna consist of your need for air, food, water, like I was saying, sleep, just how to be alive, be a human. Physiological, or excuse me, security. Security is Maybe you feel safe at home, you don't feel safe at home, and then, you know, flight training isn't really going to be number one on your agenda at this point. Next, uh, belonging examples of that. Uh, Maslow, the guy that created the pyramid, the hierarchy, he states that uh, people seek to overcome feelings of loneliness and alienation. And this, uh, this involves both giving and receiving love and affection. Next would be esteem. Feeling good about yourself, uh, good self-esteem. If you have high self-esteem, you're going to have high self-confidence and uh, you're going to be able to believe in yourself, think that you can actually do these things. Cognitive and aesthetic. Um, humans have this basic innate need to understand what's going on around them and really just a desire to learn. Um, aesthetic is directly tied to your emotions. So uh, what makes a subtle factor in the domain of persuasion, um, if an instructor doesn't like you or you don't like your instructor, then it's gonna be very hard to learn from this person or to teach this person if you are the instructor that doesn't like the student. It's just going to be a barrier that, uh, that you may not be able to get past and you may need to find another instructor or slash student in that situation. And then self-actualization, what uh, kind of like what you're born to do. You know, maybe you think that you're born to be a pilot and you'll devote everything that you have into flying. It could be anything. 
And uh, then we'll move on to defense mechanisms. There is an acronym to learn defense mechanisms, and that is triple R, double D, CPF. Uh, the first R is going to be repression. So repression is if something puts you in a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable, your mind is subconsciously going to not acknowledge that. So let's say that um, you're scared of doing a stall in an airplane. You would repress that by just not thinking of ever doing stalls. You would essentially avoid it. And uh, then another one would be rationalization. So let's say that you weren't performing well and you have an excuse for it. Let's say that you, uh, you didn't do too well on a test, but you would rationalize that by saying, you know, I didn't sleep well last night or I didn't get enough food before this test. I didn't have my coffee this morning. That'd be rationalization. Reaction formula, um, it's a fake belief opposite of your true belief because your true belief would cause anxiety. So this is basically saying or believing you're doing one thing and then actually doing the opposite. It's, uh, it's really strange to think about, actually. So let's say that you, uh, you said that you like dogs, for example but every time you get around dogs, you don't want them touching you, or you don't want to pet dogs, or you think they're gross. That could be a reaction formation. Denial is your refusal to accept why you haven't performed to standard, or you uh, refuse to accept what has happened. You know, you're, you're taxiing too fast to the runway, and your instructor brings it to your attention, and you make up these excuses, or you don't make up excuses, you say, you know, well, I, was, I wasn't I was taxiing too fast, I can see outside the window right now, and it doesn't look like I'm going faster than a brisk walk, when in reality you are. Uh, displacement is the D, in the, the second D out of the acronym, triple R, double D, CPF. Displacement is an unconscious shift of emotion um, to make an object more acceptable or uh, less threatening. So, um, going back to taking a test, you got a B and you were shooting for an A. Well, you know, a B is not too bad, so I'll displace that need for having an A with, you know, I've got a B now, so it's fine. Video messed up there, so Compensation is your counterbalancing your perceived weaknesses and uh, strengths. So let's say that you are not good at taxiing because you can't stay on your center line, uh, your taxi line when you're trying to go to the runway or something like that. But you nailed your steep turns or your stalls and instead of focusing on what you were bad at, you're compensating for like, hey, you know, I was really good at these steep turns and these stalls, why aren't you bringing that up? So uh, that's, that's something about compensation. You're trying to substitute what you did poorly with something that you did very well. Projection, you're passing the blame. So you want to, you, you didn't do something right, but it, it can't be your fault. You know, you, you may have busted your altitude um, when you're flying an approach or in non-aviation terms, you, you know, ran a stop sign. You, uh, you ran a stop sign, but it was the city's fault because there was grass growing over the stop sign and you got a ticket. But you told the police officer, you know, it's not my fault. It's the city's. The stop sign was covered up. That would be an example of uh, projecting something that you did wrong for something 
someone else did wrong being the cause of that. Fantasy is when you're just daydreaming about uh, anything else besides what you're doing. This is just like a, a defense mechanism that's like an escape of being in a high pressure situation that your, your mind is just automatically taking you somewhere else. Um, let's talk about emotional reactions now. You've got anxiety, you got normal reactions of stress, and then we got abnormal reactions of stress. So examples of anxiety would be you've you've uh, you've been mowing the grass and you have done perfect patterns and made these designs in your lawn. Um, countless times, but now someone is evaluating how well you can mow the grass and all of a sudden you've got these feelings of not being good enough or not being able to mow the grass the way that you've done it a million times and that could be a, a form of anxiety when you know you can do it, you just don't have that confidence in yourself and you feel uh, like you can't do it. Um, some some ways that people deal with anxiety, some people freeze uh, and they just can't do anything anymore. So you, you wouldn't be able to even start up the lawnmower in this situation to mow the grass. Uh, sometimes you react appropriately to anxiety and that would mean, you know, I, I've been thinking about this and I believe that I can still do it. So I'm going to go out there and mow the grass like I know that I can do it. Normal reactions to stress would um, be responding exactly and rapidly to something you've been told to do when you're training. Uh, in flying, these are very common situations. Your instructor may tell you, turn left right now and you're not thinking about why you're turning left and you're stressed out, you are maybe flying under the hood or something and you can't see, but you're just doing exactly what they're doing, what they're telling you to do. And uh, that's a normal reaction to uh, stress in a training environment. Um, in a non-aviation environment, take, uh, I guess driving would be a good uh, scenario where there's a car that has crashed in front of you and your driving instructor has told you stop get on the brakes right now and you just instantly do that that's a normal reaction to stress even though you're you're focused on the crash that just happened ahead of you abnormal reactions to stress these can these are just some things that humans do that are pretty strange. So if you're stressed out about something and you start singing or humming, then that's going to be an abnormal reaction to stress. And at that point, someone might need to take the flight controls from you. Um, you might change your mood really quickly, get extremely angry at anything that's happening. Um, it's very hazardous to have these abnormal reactions of stress and you really won't know how you're going to react to these stressful situations until you are in it and then you can see how you react and then with the help of uh, understanding your basic human behavior at this point, you can react properly once you know. If you... Uh, Let's say that you're instructing a student and they react extremely abnormally to stress. Uh, you may need to cease instructing that student. Maybe they won't be able to uh, learn properly from you because maybe being in the cockpit with you as an instructor stresses them out too much. Okay, let's move on to our basic elements of communication. So we're going to talk about the source, the symbols, the receiver. So uh, effective communication is measured by a similarity of ideas transmitted to idea received. So if I want to teach you how to open a door, 
uh, effective communication would be me explaining. You walk up to the door, grab the door handle, twist it, pull it open, and you understand that you need to walk over there, grab that door handle, open it up, pull it. Then that's effective communication. You have understood exactly what I've told you or what I've uh, tried to communicate to you. So uh, that would be a good example of that. Source is going to be the speaker. So in this instance, I'm the communicator and I'm trying to communicate to you what effective communication is. Um, ability to use language that is understandable to you would be very helpful in this situation. Um, if, if I didn't speak English or if you didn't understand English, uh, potentially, that wouldn't be a good way to effectively communicate. So language barriers are a huge issue with that. And then symbols. So not everyone has like symbols of when they are, uh, are communicating in general. So that can go back to uh, cultures and things of that sort, essentially. So um, in the Marine Corps, this is an ink stick. An ink stick may not mean anything to you because most people would say this is a pen. Uh, that's a symbol that has a different meaning and that can be a barrier to effective communication. That's uh, why we want to, particular, particularly in an aviation environment, you want to be able to say, press the yoke down, apply forward pressure, to descend or pull the yoke back, pull, apply uh, back pressure to climb. Um, a popular theory that about symbols, uh, you receive these symbols through three sensory channels. It's going to be your visual, your auditory, and your kinesthetic. So visual, you're seeing, auditory, you're hearing, kinesthetic, you're touching. You're gonna be more successful in understanding things by using a variety of these channels to understand. So if you can see, hear, and touch, all the better in this situation. And then the receiver. Um, a receiver needs to be able to understand what is trying to be communicated. So the instructor, in this case myself, would need to understand how you as a receiver would understand and listen to things. I need to know your background, your educational level, um, your willingness to participate. All of these things go into being able to communicate to someone. And then, of course, we've got barriers to effective communication, and you can understand this by an acronym, uh, COIL, C-O-I-L, and then that's going to be confusion between symbol and symbolized object. So, an airplane, right? This could be landing gear to me but to you, it could just be wheels. So these symbols and uh, objects need to have the same meaning for me that they do for the person who is learning. Um, overuse of abstractions. So if I'm not technically calling this a propeller or this the leading edge of a wing or this the nose gear or this the main gear, then I'm failing on my port to use technical terms that have one and only one meaning. Um, if I start saying, you know, the front of the airplane or the, the landing gear, you don't know if I'm talking about this over here or the nose gear. So you want to, you want to not use over, you don't want to overuse abstractions. You want to say things that uh, are concrete and 
have a true meaning, true definitions, because your your mental image that uh, that you could have of anything could be different than what I have. And next would be interference. So if we are trying to have a lesson, I'm trying to teach you something, and someone keeps walking in, asking questions, then at this point, there's a lot of interference going on, and there's not going to be effective communication. It may as well be a wash. We may as well go home at that point. And then finally, a lack of common experience. If I've got a uh, background in playing sports, but you've never played sports in your life, me relating things about baseball or football isn't going to work for you to help you understand anything. So there just needs to be a, a common uh, experience or an idea of common experience between both of us. I need to understand your background, which goes back to um, the basic elements of communication itself. And next we're going to talk about developing communication skills. So uh, role playing. In aviation we do a lot of role playing without even thinking about it. So if you're flying around and practicing learning how to be an, uh, an instrument rated pilot, I might tell you fly heading 270, climb maintain 3500. And we're role playing at this point because you don't actually have an IFR clearance and no one's actually telling you to fly heading 270 and climb to 3500. That's just us role playing. We're not on an IFR flight plan. Another thing could be chair flying. You uh, sit at home in your chair and you go through all your procedures of how you should be flying, you know. Going on takeoff, I'm going to do feet on the floor. I'm lined up on the runway, throttle full power, make sure that my RPM is between 23 and 2500. All in engine indications are in the green. That would be an example of chair flying right here. Because I'm actually, I'm acting like I'm in an airplane. I've got my hand on the yoke, other hand on the throttle, and we're role playing at this point. Instructional communication. Um, so, if an instructor has a very high level of confidence, they're going to be a lot easier to um, understand. And as an instructor, you are expected to be an expert in any particular field that you are in. So, obvious, it's not, a few things in life are obvious, so we're going to refrain from saying that word in particular because what's obvious to me may not be obvious to you, what's obvious to you may not be obvious to me. Past experiences are great ways to uh, understand how to communicate effectively. And you're just going to be able to learn easier from me if I portray to you that I know exactly what I'm talking about. Listening. Um, one thing that's very important for instructors to know what to do is how to listen. If you're not uh, listening to the feedback that your students are giving you, whether that be verbally or you're picking up on symbols of them, you know, maybe they're, you know, nodding their head, they're taking in a lot of information, but they don't really know what's going on. You got to pick up on these cues and you've got to listen, whether they're telling you or they're not telling you. And then uh, questioning, you need to, if you don't see, if you don't think that your student is truly understanding what you're talking to them about, you need to ask questions about that and sort of reiterate, are they actually understanding this? And how can I know that if I don't ask questions? So ask those questions. Ask questions often and you'll, uh, you'll be a more effective communicator as an instructor. And in structural enhancements, so I like to use instructional aids like a miniature airplane, just like the one we fly. Good old Cessna 172. And this makes it easy to understand, you know, if I'm talking about using the rudder and I hit a right rudder, right side of the nose is going to come out, left side of the tail is going to go out. Things like that um, 
enhance the instructional experience. And uh, that is my conclusion on human behavior and effective communication. Let me know if you have any questions.